And I see the kids are finding their way to their part of the service. So surprise, Jim's sitting right over here. And I get to uh, bring the word of God this morning. I, I get to share it with you. I'll say that uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity. You know, I'm nervous, but with a nervous excitement for what, uh, what I learned this week. In a, in a familiar passage of scripture we're going to get to here in a minute, but we're going to be operating today looking through the scriptures as a travel narrative, okay? I love to use, and I love to see imagery in the Bible, and before I talk, I'm going to pray, but today that's what we're going to do. We're going to, I'm going to kind of be your guide if, if I could, but before we do that, let's go ahead and pray. Thank you, God, for today. Thank you for everything that's happened in this service. Thank you for the words that Aston shared. Thank you for the communion, what Len shared. Um, thank you for preparing our hearts for what you have to say to us today. We thank you, God, for allowing us to be travelers on a journey, ultimately to your feet. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I love this whole thing about a travel narrative. The reason why I'm kind of focusing on that is we have uh, basically three things that I want to do today. I want to cover three topic chunks of information. The first one would be as we keep that travel narrative in the front of our minds. I just love that picture even. That's, that's going to become real handy here in one of my examples. But um, before we get into the reading of the scripture, I want to just mention, by the way, if you want to read along, Typically on a Sunday morning, I will use um, NIV because that's what we have in the Pew Bibles. I want it to be easy. However, when I study, I study several, I King James, I stub, uh, study several different versions to get a well-rounded picture of what we can share here on a Sunday morning. But anyway, so you got NIV Bibles in your, in your um, pews there if you want to check that out. I will be referring to one or, one or two simple things in the, in the King James. But basically... Our, uh, the bulk of what we're getting into right now, why I chose a travel narrative uh, before we get into it. If you were to, on your own study, uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 51 through Luke chapter 19, 27, that's famously called uh, Luke's travel narrative. And it's interesting, when you start reading that, you'll start seeing that Jesus makes a shift from outreach to where he becomes single-mindedly focused to go into Jerusalem, which means going to the cross. Um, so you can read that. And what's interesting about doing that, me and my wife were talking about this the other night, you can actually kind of maybe turn into a little bit of a game as you read through it. Look for the phrases that say things like, as they were walking along the road, large crowds uh, traveled with Jesus, or he was on his way to Jerusalem. There's definite movement there in the Bible. I love that about the Bible. If you tune in, and you're aware of some of the things, and you encourage each other to study that way, you will, the scenes will move. I love that. So let's start off with um, Luke. We're going to read uh, chapter 9, verse 51 through 62. And uh, so it says, uh, verse 51, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go, Jesus replied. Foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So if I could have a t-shirt made 
And this is where I'm going to drive our media team crazy. These guys are so patient with us. They work real hard to get these scriptures in front of you, but every now and then something pops up. Um, if I could have a t-shirt made, it's almost like a theme right now. I want to encourage you all. I mentioned it a couple weeks back. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 10 and 11 talks about the importance of loving the truth and the loving the truth. The devil quoted scriptures. There are people that know the Bible way better than me and could argue with me, but they don't love that truth. Loving the truth, loving the word of God in that way will keep you from deception. And uh, Jim mentioned here a couple weeks ago, I like when he says that he said it more than once, that he's a one-trick pony. I go, if that, if that trick is teaching the word of God in all honesty with all his heart, that's a great trick. That's what I hope to intend to do today as well. So um, we're, we're thankful for that. So um, I'm going to go back to, as we read that scripture there, uh, verse 51. It says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Okay, here's something that's not up there. In the King James, it says that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. There was something there. Again, there was a shift from Jesus doing outreach. It's almost like in my mind I could see him turn figuratively and just know the cross is waiting for me. I am now going to take that next chapter in my ministry. And it's interesting. If we can go to the last verse in that passage. That's uh, 62. And uh, back in San Jose, Silicon Valley, you wouldn't imagine there'd be many farmers there, but there was a farmer in our Bible study. And uh, this verse, let me read this to you. Uh, it says, no one puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. This farmer, I can't remember who it was, one of our little Bible studies mentioned, oh yeah, back on the farm, you know how we made straight lines in the fields? If there's any farmers in the audience, you might check me on this. But they said we would point our tractor in one direction and sometimes use the, the, whatever you had there in the front of the tractor on a fixed point and you just go to that point and never deviate to the right or to the left and I did some research on this, and it was kind of interesting to see where we've gone. Now we've got GPS, we've got all this stuff, and it's kind of, but I kind of like the old school thing because it, it took me right to the pages of the Bible. So Jesus, in that same way, had a singular focus on Jerusalem. Everything from this point forward, and in, in the Gospel of Luke especially, a big chunk of it, famously called Luke's Travel Narrative, so look for that. Something about that determination to go forward and nothing was going to nothing was going to change that okay um, I will say uh, so our journey begins in the same way with a decision but more than that as we travel along maybe we haven't started our journey maybe we don't think about a journey but you can clearly identify the fact that you have started your journey when you know something's missing, okay? Um, I'm about to share something here, but I'd like to, I'd like to mention here, I have this Bible, and on, on my journey, on my travels as, as a believer, as a, a person who came to know Jesus, I met some people. One of the people I met is the guy who gave me this Bible. He's in heaven now. I may have mentioned this before. His name was Richard Chavez, and he gave me this Bible, and uh, I, I'm able to read this Bible, and I see things underlined, and I go, gosh, he always underlined the coolest things, you know. What do I want to learn? There it is. It's unlined. So I kind of experience, and I reflect back. Jesus talked about being facing Jerusalem, being steadfast, and we just mentioned about not looking back. There's a time to reflect. That's different. We can reflect on this journey and with thankfulness in our hearts. And so that's kind of what I was going to mention a little bit right now. I would like to also mention, as I reflect on my own travel narrative, uh, my friend Les, who used to sit in like the second or third pew over there, it seems like God has always put somebody in my life. I imagine we could all say this, but I think of uh, Brother Les. And uh, Les, as we all know, would love to sing. So the way I... And me and Les used to share a lot, of, a lot of humor and stuff like that. I would see Les from across the parking lot, and, uh, and I would say, hello, and he would go, hello. And we'd, we'd have a three-piece harmony, and there's only two of us. <laughs> That's a miracle, right? 
That happened all the time. That was amazing. I miss, I miss my brother less. He was such an encouragement, big booming voice. And I also think back to my first exposure to Christianity back in Santa Clara at the church we used to go to. My friend, all I can remember, his name was Cam, and he was taller than Les, and he used to greet me in a suit, and he had thick Coke bottle glasses or whatever, and he used to come in the big boys, good morning, brother, or whatever, and he had, God bless you. And I, just, you know, I think of things like that as part of my journey, as part of my travel narrative. Um, so the definition of a narrative, before I get too uh, uh, far ahead of myself, a spoken or written account of connected events or a story, okay? It's helpful to think of our walk with Jesus as that, as it quite literally is. So point number two that I'd like to mention, okay, I'm sorry, point number one, I skipped right over it. The whole reason for mentioning this travel narrative in Luke 9:51. The first point is Jesus knew where he was going. There was no doubt he knew where he was going. And uh, so that's something to contrast us. Okay, point number two is our journey begins when we know something's missing, but we don't always know where we're going. Okay, we depend on people. We depend on God's word more than anything. Okay, so anyway, I talked a little bit about reflecting um, with people, but... There's something here, kind of a, a fun little thing that I wanted to mention to us is, uh, okay, how many people have ever, ever heard of Pilgrim's Progress? Okay, all right, quite a few of us. Um, back in 1978, you can see the, the picture there. I'm just going to read this. It says, the Pilgrim's Progress from this world to that which is to come is a 1678 Christian allegory written by John Bunyan, while in a Bedford, England prison for his persistent preaching of the gospel. It's regarded as, as one of the most significant works of theological fiction and English literature and a progenitor of the narrative aspect of Christian media. It's been translated into more than 200 languages and has never been out of print. Okay, <clears throat> I've seen the 1978 illustrated, not CG, not computer, illustrated, um, film, cartoon, if you will. If you can find that one, it's not often that I would get up here and endorse something. With all my heart, I would encourage you. Um, hey, man, it, it's, it's almost like they, they speak King James through the whole thing. It is so biblical. It's only like 37 minutes long. You can't even really find it anymore. We have it on VHS at the house, so actually. so, And I think we caught it when it was still kind of fresh. But anyway, you can find it all over YouTube. It's well worth it. We used to use this as an evangelistic tool, invite people over here, let's watch a cartoon. What are you talking, man, at the end of it? Anyway, it chronicles basically um, the life of the individual you see there. Uh, that's Christian, and he's bearing the weight of a burden on his back. And eventually, not to give it all away, but he runs into a friend, a friend named Faithful. And I just thought, wow, what a cool thing. Um, I was with my daughter the other day, and she mentioned that somebody, somebody was talking to her and didn't know how to describe what a Christian was. She goes, oh, I know somebody who is, um, who is faithful. And I guess she, that was her way of saying that they go to church. And I thought, how cool is that? I want to I be that, number one, but I would like to start using that, referring to people around me as faithful. And wouldn't that be cool that someone refers to you as faithful? Anyway, you see in this, in this little illustrated cartoon... Um, this journey, and I love it, that it's a, 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 um, a walk that he goes through, and he's carrying a burden. Eventually, he comes to the cross, and then the journey isn't over there. He continues as he lives out his Christian faith. It's so inspiring. So Paul Bunyan wrote this, and here's just kind of a bonus little funny fact, and God has a sense of humor. Paul Bunyan chron chronicled uh, a long journey, and I, I've never had sore feet, but don't they, they call that a Bunyan? Or you can get bunions, right? Something like that. I also learned that he was in jail at least twice. And they said he may have written, it's like 300 years ago, he may have written this story in a 12-year stretch that he took. Or, or I think there was another one that was like six months or something like that. Anyway, it's kind of interesting how there's a little bit of unknowns there. But what was cool about it, Paul Bunyan, while he was in jail, the way he supported his family, he made shoelaces to support his family. What's that? John Bunyan, Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan is the guy with the 
The blue horse. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm messing with Jim. He knows all the facts. <laughs> yeah. John Bunyan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he preached to prisoners and wrote various works. Anyway, so I just thought that was kind of funny, funny thing. He made shoelaces to support, to support his families. All right. Um, so what I did was uh, on the way to church, you know, you're always chewing on the scripture several conversations with my wife as I'm studying this this week, and I kind of determined there's so many things that I was learning, and I said, I'm just, I'm not going to be able to share all of them. I'm going to forget half of them. So I did write down a few, and, um, but one of the things um, that I want to point out was the imagery of, I've never been to the Holy Land. I understand there are shores. I imagine the shores are soft, and you could see footprints in the sand, I imagine some of the land is very rocky, and maybe footprints don't stand out. Any one of these days, I'll see it. But um, there's, there's an imagery about footprints coming together, and there's just a couple examples here in the Bible that I want to mention to you. But I love that imagery. If you could see one traveler coming this way, another traveler coming that way, and they meet, I imagine that happened time and time again in the Bible. But as a, as a picture of life, I like to do things that way. It just, it, it just helps things stay with me, how God has wired me that way. Okay? So the first thing I'd like to mention as um, two, two different meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, was um, the calling of the disciples. And the three uh, main uh, pictures of that is uh, Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 22. It's up there if you guys want to make a note of that. Also Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 16 through 20. And then again in Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Three different accounts of Jesus calling the disciples. Uh, probably my favorite one is uh, in Mark chapter 5 when uh, the demoniac met Jesus face to face. And uh, that is a powerful story right there. But there's something about coming face to face, coming face, -to -face with Jesus and then seeing what the reaction is of those how do they react when, when they encounter Jesus? All right. So the main scripture that I want to share with you today as we can continue our travel narrative um, is about the rich young ruler. And again, it's mentioned in three of the Gospels. Um, in all, it, it, the rich young ruler, again, you know, we read these stories. Read, we read them a lot. Uh, every time I read one of these, I say, I pray, God, help my heart to not just be so familiar with this that he can't teach me something. I love that picture up there that we put up every week of the Bible with all the notes, and I think that's Haley's Bible. That, every time I see that, I, I actually stop, and I just ponder that, and I go, God, I want that to be my heart. Our heart needs to be that very thing. You know, taking time to work and let God speak to us. So anyway... That's, that's a nice reminder every week. I just love seeing that. So we've got three Gospels that mention this. Um, now, we, we know uh, typically that he was a rich young ruler, but how do we know that? Well, all three of those Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and Mark, say that he was rich. But in Matthew, it mentions that he's young. Luke mentions that he was a ruler. All these things mean something to the story. Okay? Mark is, is a little bit different, and what fascinated me, I was standing in the kitchen at home, and I actually had a laugh. Mark is typically known, at, out of all the Gospels, it, it's fast-moving, there's not a lot of details, there's, there's just quick movement, and then this happened, and then this happened. It's interesting that Mark brings out a detail saying that the rich young ruler, he ran and he knelt. That's something that the other gospel, it just says there was a man in the other gospels. But Mark says he ran and he knelt. We'll get to that in a second, okay? So we don't know a whole lot about this rich young ruler, but we can glean from the scriptures a little bit on the background of what it meant to be young and a ruler. It says that he was a ruler, which means he was probably a part of the Jewish council, probably a Pharisee, and well-respected surrounded by many teachers, a powerful guy. And even up to this morning, driving to church as I'm just kind of going over things, I'm reminded that, well, as, let, me, let me read the scripture here first before I get too far ahead of myself, okay? So Mark chapter 10, 
uh, 17 through 31. It says, As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up and knelt before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus replied. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not cheat others. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he replied, all these I have kept from my youth. Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said to him, there's one thing you lack. Go, sell everything you own and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But the man was saddened by these words and went away in sorrow because he had great wealth. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. They were even more astonished and said to one another, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, look, we've left everything and followed you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundredfold in the present age, houses and brothers, sisters and mothers and children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. A little footnote there, right there. Even that last verse, there's something there that we can key in on. So if we could go back to verse 17 and, and take a look at that. It's always fascinating to know what was it like when Jesus was walking from town to town. I often see in the scriptures, obviously, many, many people, probably lots of noise, even oftentimes chaos. Well, here's a person who was a Pharisee. Like we said before, he was respected, well-known, um, not only rich, but exceedingly rich, and, and he was young on top of that. Yet, <clears throat> here's a person who enjoyed being seen. The, the Pharisees had the reputation that they enjoyed being seen. They liked being seen, praying publicly. But here, it's interesting. This guy says, ran up and knelt before Jesus. Kind of interesting. It, it seems risky. He doesn't know what Jesus is going to say, but if he had everything... As you read the scriptures, as you study this, it's almost like he was, eternal life was an add-on to what he already had. But he was apparently in chaos, or he was in crisis, as we see here. Um, this guy would have also been surrounded by, like, great teachers, yet there was something about Jesus that drew him in and made him ask the question. It's interesting that Jesus mentioned a few of the commandments, and then later on he says, there's one thing you lack. Go sell everything you own, give to the poor, and you will receive treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Okay, one powerful thing about this scripture here is in verse 21, there's kind of three things that take place, and this just really stays with me. It stayed with me for so many months. The first thing is Jesus looked at him. The second thing, Jesus loved him. And the third thing, Jesus said to him. So there's this chaos. Here's this highly revered person. And again, I imagine the scene was very noisy, very crowded, maybe chaotic. Here's a person that by his behavior, he was possibly so used to just being the first in line for everything, he ran up to Jesus, yet he knelt. So he ran up, but at the same time, he knelt. So this guy was in crisis. Something was missing. The first thing, in the middle of all that, it says Jesus looked at him. And again, I was talking about this 
with my wife the other day, and, and she's, oh, what are you looking at me funny like that? Because I was talking to her. I took my glasses off so I could see her clearly. Now, Jesus doesn't wear glasses, but it just, it just caused me to think. Jesus, the scripture says that he looked at him. There was something significant, and I'll say this. He had Jesus' attention. So as an encouragement to us, if, if our life is chaos, if there's trouble, if we're in crisis, if we're sincere, we have his attention. The next thing, however, is, is the hard part. It says that he loved him and said to him. Jesus loved him and gave him the truth. Okay, so there we are, footprints meeting. This is, there's, there's that moment right there. In our hearts, we can come to that place over and over. If we don't know Christ yet and we're just kind of checking it out, this would be one of those things where you might want to say, wow, what's happening right now? Even in our continued walk with Jesus, we might have moments where we got to remember that Jesus loves us because if we hear something from the Bible that just rubs us the wrong way, challenges us, causes us to really think, wow, maybe I've been wrong about something. What in my heart needs to change? we got to remember that Jesus loves us enough to tell us the truth. Now, in this world right now, that's not an easy thing to even talk about because the, the truth isn't always what we want to hear. But if we truly love people, we got to be willing to do that too. Have the heart of Jesus and love them and then share truth, even if it's not the popular thing to do, especially in today's culture. So point number three, um, Jesus looked at him, Jesus loved him, and then he addressed his heart issue. This guy, his security, his heart was wrapped up in his possessions. And that's why Jesus told him, Give everything you have to the poor. Also, the last scripture in uh, verse 31 there, it says, many who are first will be last and the last will be first. This was an opportunity for him to get rid of the obstacle that was hindering him from trusting Jesus. So in spite of his crisis, in spite of him coming and kneeling in front of Jesus, he still walked away brokenhearted and sad. He couldn't, he couldn't, do what Jesus told him he needed to do to receive that eternal life. He went back to his, the thing that he was familiar with and was holding on to. So for us, um, it's going to be something different. It doesn't have to be money. Um, I did speak to somebody this week, and uh, I learned, because I was sharing with somebody what I'm going to be sharing with you today, and this person was pretty frustrated. They go, I don't get it. The Bible, sometimes it's just so hard to understand. I know that. And I hope that you guys always feel encouraged to ask questions. If there's something I'm mentioning here, or if I'm talking too fast, there's something here that you don't understand, please feel free to come up and ask me, ask Jim. There's plenty of people here. We got great Bible students here in the church. So it was, it was a good reminder to me as I do this that that I want to encourage you to ask questions if you have them. But in this case, um, the obstacle keeping him from trusting Jesus was his possession. So you fill in the blank. What is it that God is speaking to you that is keeping you from wholeheartedly trusting Jesus? And then God, God will help you know what that is. And then in his love, he'll help you give that up so you can experience the fullness of his life. So his wealth was his problem, the thing that kept him from trusting in Jesus, the cost of discipleship. Um, little footnote here, Jesus says, and then follow me. I love it. If you're following Jesus, that means he's leading you. Powerful stuff right there. Um, I'm going to ask the band to go ahead and come up. If you guys are around, available, close by. So I wanted to point out some things to consider here as we read these, these uh, scriptures. And I encourage you to go ahead and study them yourself. But to leave you with some things that you can actually do, here's a few points. Um, ask yourself, or 
we can ask ourselves, have we recognized that something is missing? Have we started our own journey is the way I like to point that out. Have we realized that something's missing? Maybe, maybe not. Um, number two, have we, have we arrived at the feet of Jesus yet? Uh, number three, what will we ask of him when we do arrive at his feet? Here's the tough one. Will we turn away or follow him when he speaks? Either thing could happen, depending where we're at, depending where our heart is. And then most importantly, as we go forward, will we follow Jesus' example by loving others enough to share the truth? So they're going to they're gonna close another song. Let, let that sink into your heart. And then we're going to close after that.